to learn about in their school, actually. Um, that, was, that was something that didn't happen in my schooling. As I grew up in Tasmania, we were taught that there were no ta Tasmanian Aboriginals, for instance. Um, this is something that's just wholly untrue and was part of the ongoing dispossession and violence that is perpetuated on First Nation communities right across Australia. And it's just so crucial now that we are passing on the, the true history of Australia, the Aboriginal history to uh, all of us, to those that missed that and, and those to come and acknowledge that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And we need to break that silence and, and share the land on which we meet. I'm, I'm coming to you from the land of the Gadigal, Gwigal, Imbidjigal people of the Eora Nation. And I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and future. And I would invite you to do the same. Um, I think a few people, as I'm seeing over in the thread, may already be doing that. So please, if you can, share in the chat the land uh, um, of the First Nations people on which you're coming into us uh, from now or perhaps where you grew up. Uh, I want to start this evening by introducing Carla McGrath. Uh, I couldn't be more fortunate to have um, Carla as the chair of GetUp, nor could the um, over a million Australians who come to GetUp to take political action. Um, Carla is a proud Torres Strait Islander woman and brings a wealth of experience um, in Indigenous public policy, collaborative leadership, governance um, and expertise in campaigning and communications and from a range of organisations like the Centre, the National Centre for Indigenous Excellence, the Australian Indigenous Mentoring Experience, the New South Wales Reconciliation Council and so many more. Um, we'll be here all night if I talk to all of Carla's amazing experience. But thank you, Carla, and um, I'll hand over to you to run us through the evening. Thanks so much, Paul. Thanks for your um, lovely acknowledgement as well. I think that's a really important way to start uh, this very interesting conversation that we're about to have. And I'm so pleased to see so many people joining you in that, which I will as well. Uh, my name's Carla McGrath, proud Torres Strait Islander woman and coming to you from the lands of the Gimwe, Wallaburra, Yirinji and Yirikanji peoples up here around the Cairns region in far North Queensland. I'd like to thank their elders past, present and emerging for keeping this amazing country, this fantastic land and sea country safe and healthy uh, through some pretty challenging times, particularly in the last few hundred years. So here we are. I have the great task of being your host this evening and what a fun job that's going to be. Um, 2020 has been a big year. And after the unprecedented bushfires that gripped the country last year, COVID-19 brought us massive disruption, forced political realignment and new thinking. And it also demonstrated what's possible if we act with urgency around a common challenge and really listen to science and exercise some political courage. As an organisation, GetUp has long been a passionate advocate of ambitious, and, uh, ambitious action on climate to create jobs and bring down prices and lower our emissions in line with our Paris commitments. And at the moment, we're fighting a number of campaigns to protect and properly fund our clean energy agencies, the Australian Renewable Energy Agency and the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, to demonstrate the lack of funding for rebuilding of bushfire affected communities. And most importantly, we've commissioned the most comprehensive review ever undertaken of the Murdoch's media climate coverage to be launched in December, watch this space. As an individual and a Torres Strait Islander, issues of climate change are as urgent as they can possibly be for me with our island communities at the front line of rising sea levels and king tides. That's ever present for me and it's one of the reasons I'm absolutely delighted to host this discussion this evening. And for that discussion, I am joined by our two panellists. If you've tuned in, I'm assuming our panellists need little to no introduction, so we will keep this bit a bit brief. But tonight we are joined by renowned author, academic, scientist, explorer and conservationist, Australian of the Year and Chief Counselor of the Climate Council, Professor Tim Flannery, who has recently published a book that looks at what's possible when governments listen to the science and act accordingly, titled The Climate Cure, Solving the Climate Emergency in the Era of COVID-19. It's wonderful to have you with us, Tim. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be with you, Carla, calling in from Darawal country. So, 
It's good to be here. Thank you. And we are also joined uh, for this discussion tonight by the Honourable Malcolm Turnbull, 29th Prime Minister of Australia. Mr Turnbull is a Rhodes Scholar who, prior to entering politics, worked as a journalist, lawyer, merchant banker, venture capitalist and many other things. I get up and Malcolm uh, don't always see eye to eye on every issue, it must be said, and we, along with many progressive groups, campaigned fiercely against some of the decisions he made whilst in government. Uh, as an independent movement, we're committed to holding those with power to account, no matter what party they're from. But Malcolm is a forceful advocate of more ambitious action on climate, and he, he's critical of the co current government's inaction and has a unique and powerful perspective on the challenges of reaching consensus on these issues and the role that the Murdoch media plays in delaying and disrupting progress. We're grateful to him for making time for this important conversation tonight. Welcome, Malcolm. Well, thanks, Carla. It's great to be with you all. Uh, uh, like Paul, I'm in Gadigal country uh, here um, uh, in uh, in the suburb, uh, well, the larger area of Wallara, which was uh, uh, a uh, Gadigal word for lookout. And welcome to all those who also might be tuning in from the lovely Wallara. Mm. So I'm going to cut to the chase because we only have a small amount of time with all of you. Um, and I'd like to direct, if I can, my first question to you, Tim, about this amazing book that we're hearing about. Mm. It'd be wonderful for you to tell us about this book the climate cure and why you think the experience of COVID-19 provides a model for the path forward on climate policy. Sure. Well, look, thanks, Carla. I wrote the book really with a sense that this was the, the last moment that we as humans had to avoid really serious climate damage. We're already suffering damage, but it will grow disproportionately from this point on if we don't act. And as I was writing the book, you know, the bushfires were burning, we were seeing the reality of, of, of climate change unfold. But then a month or two later, we saw COVID arrive in the country. And I remember I, I talked to the chief medical officer in January about, about this. And um, I was really surprised at how tuned in the government was with the science. So, you know, we called a pandemic two weeks before the World Health Organization did it. You know, we took the economically courageous step of closing down flights from China very early on in February. And by the 13th of March, when cases in Australia were doubling every four days, our Prime Minister stepped up to the mark and we saw a lockdown um, and, and, a, and a really a reorganisation of government that today has kept us safe, which is great. So we're through a critical hurdle. And I just kept asking myself, if they, we can do this with COVID, and seemingly break all of the conventions that you know, surround our thoughts about government deficits and how government works and so forth. Why can't we do it with the climate emergency? And that COVID situation did teach us exactly the steps we need to take. You know, The first thing is you stop the spread of the problem. And for climate change, that means cutting emissions. We know the science is telling us we need to cut 8% per year, year on year for the next decade. We know technologically we can do that, with government leadership, we can do it easily, I would say, without massive disruption. We also know that we've got to have enough emergency capacity to deal with all the casualties we've already created. We did that with COVID, with hospitals and so forth. With climate, it means dealing with everything from the additional casualties we'll have from heat waves through to the Great Barrier Reef, which is another casualty, making sure we've got the capacity to minimise the damage to places like the Great Barrier Reef, our biodiversity, our eroding coasts and so forth. So we know we can do that. It's called adaptation. It needs to be a big part of the way you respond to the problem. And finally, we need to set search for the equivalent of a vaccine. And that will come when we start drawing CO2 out of the atmosphere. As David Attenborough said in his recent movie, A Life on Earth, we need to rewild our planet. We need to regrow our forests to capture that carbon. We need to grow seaweed in the oceans to do the same sort of thing. We need to be kinder to our environment so it's got the chance to recover and so create a vaccine for this enormous amount of CO2 that we're putting into the atmosphere. Now, that's a very long-term project. The outcomes are very uncertain and it's going to be very expensive, exactly like vaccine development for COVID. But we know we can do all of this. And the starting point for doing it all is recognising that we are in a true emergency. 
It's a slower emergency than COVID, but it is a genuine emergency and action needs to start now. Absolutely, it does. Um, thank you, Tim. Uh, Malcolm, I might go to you now, and I, I wonder, um, we've heard there from, uh, from Tim that the process is quite similar and replicable within these two um, crises that we're, we've been experiencing as a country and, as a, and globally. Um, what do you think about the, why do you think the approach to co the COVID crisis has been so different to the approach to the climate crisis? Yeah, thanks, sorry, I was muted. Uh, there's, there was quite a bit of science denialism in the early stages of the COVID crisis, you, you remember. Um, so there is a, uh, you know, a tendency on the populist right to turn issues of science into issues of, you know, ideology or identity. Uh, you know, Joe, Joe, otherwise, why would Joe Biden have to say wearing a mask is not a political statement? You know, it's, but, it, but it has become so in America. Um, look, I think I, I, I agree with I agree with Tim's points. Uh, the, the, the fact is that COVID is, was moving more quickly. It was more immediate. Uh, there has been uh, this extraordinary uh, uh, phenomenon that we have seen where a matter of physics, i.e. global warming, has been treated like an issue of identity or, or ideology. It's, it's, cra it's genuinely crazy and dangerously so. Um, the, uh, the, the, the logical thing to do, the answer, is clearly to get on and cut our emissions in the way that Tim and I have talked about at you know, different times over many years. The, the, what is really extraordinary now, and I mean, going back, I guess Tim and I have talked about this issue for, well, it must be close to 20 years, Tim, but if you go back to, to when I was first environment minister, yeah, but probably longer than that, but when I was first environment minister in Howard's government, the cost of renewables was much higher than you know, generating electricity from burning fossil fuels. And so there, you know, there was a debate, how much are we prepared to pay? How much more do we have to pay for our electricity? We're now in the situation where thanks to technological developments, we can have cheap uh, electricity, cheaper than ever with zero emissions. So it literally is one of those very few times in life where you can have your cake and eat it too. And so there is literally no excuse anymore for not getting on with it. Now you've got to plan it, you've got to think ahead. That's why Snowy 2.0 was so important because it, you can build you know, wind turbines, let alone solar panels, a lot quicker than you can build uh, pumped hydro. But as long as you plan it, uh, we can have our cake and eat it too. We can have cheap electricity and zero emissions. And so we, we really, it is so frustrating to see people denying science, dragging their heels, and particularly with the, you know, the populist right and their amplifiers in the Murdoch media and other right-wing media, uh, just promoting, you know, dangerous falsehoods uh, and denying the science, denying reality, and of course, with all of the catastrophic consequences that can follow from that. Thank you. What we are seeing uh, is some interesting movements in, in state, um, uh, in our state governments that we're not necessarily seeing reflected in our, in our federal government's responses when it comes to this. And I have a question here from Richard Bentley from Adelaide, and he wonders, Will the actions of state governments make the actions slash inactions of federal governments irrelevant? All states have a net zero by 2050 target and are investing to meet and likely beat those targets. Can we afford to ignore Canberra? I wonder, Malcolm, if I could pose that question to you, and I guess with a follow-up, is um, are we seeing, um, is some of that action that we're seeing giving us some hopeful signs that yeah. our leaders in our states, yeah. particularly in our liberal, uh, our liberal leaders in our well, states. Well, look, the, 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 Carla, you, you, the, and, and thank you very much for the question. But it, look, it's, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the federal government has abandoned any efforts to lead on energy. Um, the, uh, and, but 
thank thankfully we're seeing real leadership from the states and you know whether it's the liberal governments in um, New South Wales Tasmania um, or South Australia or the labor ones in the other jurisdictions they're all basically on the same agenda which is net zero by 2050 and uh, focusing on the same process of you know getting more renewables out there getting more transmission making sure you've got the st storage in place you know with various techniques to do that uh, it's all doable and I, I just look you know the the last big federal program energy program was the the RET now that is you know that is full I mean the, the small scale uh, uh, renewable energy subsidy you know continues for solar uh, but the, um, you know, the, the large scale renewable energy target is basically filled, but, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter that it's hasn't been continued because the economics is just so, are just so compelling now. So frankly, the less we hear from the federal government on energy, possibly the better because they've got nothing constructive to add at the moment. I mean, the, the you know, the gas led recovery is honestly a mirage. It's a, I mean, I described it as political piffle the other day, which is probably too generous, but you know, the, you don't take my word for it. You've got, you know, the Grattan's just come out with some analysis, you know, Tony Wood, that well-known sort of left-wing character. I mean, you know, probably the leading energy analyst in the world of think tanks uh, made the same point. And of course you've got AEMO's own work, the Australian energy market operator, which is, uh, you know, one of the best organisations of its kind in the world. So, so we know what the answer is. We've got the tools to do it, but we've got to get on do it, doing it. Can I, can I just make one final point? Because I think this might be something others will want to comment on. Look, we have to recognise that regardless of the political debate, you cannot uh, talk physics out of operating. I mean, global warming will progress uh, unstopped unless the political action is taken. All of the denialism in Canberra or Washington or wherever is not going to suspend the laws of physics, first point. Second point is, in terms of our economic future, the reality is coal is coming to an end. Now, that's good. We need that. And, and it will be followed by gas. Uh, you know, gas's role in our electricity uh, market is actually very, is very relatively very low, by the way. But anyway, that's going to happen. Our coal uh, industry is largely an export industry. Our trading partners are all moving to net zero by 2050 or, or thereabouts, including China. So what we need is to recognize that change is coming. It's coming quicker than uh, many of us imagined some years ago. That's a good thing, but we can't deny it. And so Australia has to get on and plan for a post-coal world. And that's why the big vision of clean, affordable, renewable energy is what we should be focused on because the opportunities there are immense. Tim, I want to talk about that a little bit further with you, considering um, what Malcolm's talked about, you know, coal coming to the end and obviously in the future that, that we're needing to, to envisage. Thinking about the scale and the urgency um, of the government's COVID response begs the question, how, just how ambitious can we be around this? So the former um, head of ARENA, Darren Miller, suggested we shouldn't be aiming for 100% renewables, but more like 700% renewables, <clears throat> mm, and that right. um, exporting to the rest of the world. Um, are the Paris commitments enough? And what are your top priorities and ambitions for climate action? Just to comment on the, the idea that, you know, the federal government's the, the roadblock and that the states can all do it. I mean, maybe in terms of clean energy deployment, they can, but it'll be slower than it would be if we had federal leadership. And we are now really in the last moments of being able to do something. The next few years will tell. Um, and if we continue as we are, we don't alter the trajectory, we will pre-commit ourselves to a point where we'll hit some of Earth's tipping points and then we'll lose control. Nothing we do will matter. The federal government leadership is crucially important. We've got the, the Glasgow meeting coming up, COP26, where the nations of the world have to agree more ambition. If Australia plays a spoiling role there, as we look like we might, um, trying to have a gas-fed recovery, 
it'll be catastrophic unless we get our act together in terms of adaptation and and make sure that we protect all Australians from the inevitable climate change that's going to uh, unfold over the next um, coming years. It'll be a catastrophe. So, and, and we've got to look for that vaccine. We have to have, Australia has to play a role globally in the search for the long-term and enduring solution to this problem. Um, if we don't do that, we will face deep, deep difficulties. So federal leadership is critical. And I just ask our prime minister to, to consider the fate of all Australians in this. Consider the welfare of all Australians. We need his leadership at the moment. We don't have time to uh, elect another prime minister. This has to be done now. So we need to see a change that allows the government, the federal government to comprehend the true gravity of the danger that we face and the urgency of action. So sure, we can do a certain amount alone. Maybe if we had every single state government, every single council, every single business on side, we could say the federal government was less important. But really, um, the prime minister's position is an enormously powerful one. And it's one that needs to unite rather than divide the country. Absolutely. Um, and I think uh, what you're impressing upon the Prime Minister there is to be as, um, as ambitious as he, as he possibly can be. If you were to put forward your most ambitious plan, what would that look like? I would say, you know, Prime Minister, we're in the last moments of being able to deal with this crisis. Prepare yourself for a very positive role at, at Glasgow. Um, make Australia a leader rather than a spoiler in this. Let's get our own act in order. Let's set an ambitious target. Let's get all of the programs in place we need for a swift transition so we can cut our own emissions. Let's get a comprehensive adaptation package together. Let's make, let's look at the barrier reef carefully, work out, I know the government, the federal government's doing some things in these areas, but we need to take a comprehensive approach. Look at the great barrier reef, see what we can do. Uh, to really affect the outcome there. Have a look at our biodiversity, have a look at our coasts and the damage being done by rising sea levels. Have a look at heat waves and ask, are our fire services, are our, our, our hospitals, are they up to dealing with, with heat waves, mega fires, floods, everything else that we know is coming down the pipeline. And then finally, look at, look at the, as I said, the vaccine. Look at how we treat our forests. Is there anything we can do to try to really on large scale sequester carbon in our soils and in our oceans? And can we bring that to Glasgow as part of a bigger initiative, even for the region, for the Melanesian and the Southeast Asian region? We could be a powerhouse in this area. We're not insignificant. And you know, the, the Prime Minister and others keep saying, oh, we're only 1.4% of the problem. You know, that, that's all we emit. Um, the truth is we were 1.4% of the Allied forces in the Second World War. If the Prime Minister had said then that we're only 1.4%, so it doesn't matter what we do, it would have been considered treason. And so it should be today with, with, with this failure to take action to protect us at this absolutely critical moment. Absolutely. What we're seeing popping up now too in our um, Q&A is, is this idea of how do we turn this... Um, uh, policy into action. And Malcolm, I might come to you with that question. What would you suggest are the best ways to let the coalition know this is an important issue and to help them shift the policy? Well, look, ultimately, uh, Morrison is in the position that he does not want to get uh, torn down by the right uh, or attacked by the right in the way I was, okay? So Scott is not a, he's not a climate denialist. He, you know, he's a very pragmatic person, uh, but he also understands politics. He likes being prime minister and he wants to stay there. Uh, most, most prime ministers do, I might add. Um, the, and so he knows this is like a third rail and that, that toxic combination of the right wing in the, party room, particularly out of the LNP, the right-wing media, particularly Murdoch, and vested interests in the fossil fuels industry can be absolutely deadly. Uh, and, you know, because they turn this into a 
an issue of ideology. Now, it's got nothing to do with left v right, by the way. I mean, Boris Johnson is committed. You know, Boris Johnson is hardly a, you know, dripping wet lefty. Uh, you know, he's got plenty of right wing populist genes in, in his body, but he's he doesn't deny climate change. He's absolutely committed to, you know, taking action, you know, getting banning, uh, uh, you know, internal combustion engine cars and, you know, moving to a uh, renewable led economy, all of that stuff. So, so this is not a, this is honestly a bizarre construct that we share in Australia probably only uh, in any meaningful way with the United States. And I think part of the common denominator is Murdoch, but it is a, you know, it is this absurdity where people are saying, I believe or disbelieve in global warming. It's like, so I've said many times, it's like saying you believe or disbelieve in gravity, you know? Now that's the, that, that's the challenge. So, so what Morrison is trying to do is not rile that base. He does not want to have them turn on him. Uh, I think the, the, uh, the other problem, of course, is that there has been really, really poor advocacy from the progressive side of politics on this. So I hope no one takes this as a criticism, but I've just got to be frank with you. I mean, the message that, that we need to get across about renewables and clean energy is that it means jobs. You know, it means more jobs. It means a stronger economy. It means greater opportunities. It means cheaper electricity. But, you know, once you, you know, once you create the impression for working people, particularly people in, in industry, particularly in coal mining, in, you know, the energy sector where it's underpinned by burning coal, once you create the impression that this green agenda is going to cost them their jobs, then naturally they're going to be affronted by that and threatened by that. Now, you know, we are now in this strong position where we can say without a hint of exaggeration, without any embellishment, without any wishful thinking, that the cheapest form of electricity is renewables plus storage. All we've got to do is put it in place and we'll have abundant uh, cheap electricity. I mean, the, you know, yes, I think mm. our, our target should be 700% uh, renewables or 200% as they've said in Tasmania, as long as you can find markets for it. But, you know, mm. we've got that opportunity and it just needs stronger advocacy in those constituencies because that's, that's where the uh, Labor Party is getting wedged. Obviously, Joel Fitzgibbon's a good example of that. And that is what many of the hard heads in the coalition see this issue as doing, as being able to split Labor's traditional blue collar base away from the party. And mm. that is based, honestly, on what is now, on any view, a misapprehension, not just of the science, but of the economics. So what we saw after his defeat um, at the last election, uh, Tony Abbott described a difference between people who see climate action as a moral concern versus those who see it as an economic concern. We saw uh, last week you gave Paul Kelly a bit of a serve on, on News Corp, gave him a bit of a piece of your mind um, for maintaining that editorial line that tries to entrench that that divide. Why do you think that divide is so entrenched and what needs to happen for politicians to have the confidence and the capability to sell the economic opportunities associated with strong action on climate? Well, I mean, you've got, you've, you've obviously got to be able to communicate effectively. I mean, a lot of this is, is how you deliver the message because, but you know, the, often the task of the advocate is a difficult one. Often you've got to persuade people to agree with something that is against their interests or, you know, in against their interests in the short term, but in their interests in the long term. You know, often you have to try to persuade people to swallow a bitter pill. Here, we can say with hand on heart, utterly truthfully, that there is a future post coal of abundant, cheap, clean electricity. Now that is a, you know, that, look, if, if Tim and I have been accused at different times of uh, fantasizing and being unrealistic, Tim more than me perhaps, but, but you know, and if you'd said that 20 years ago, it would have been, uh, you know, a crazy green dream. It is absolutely correct today. And so this is the loopiness of it, 
you know, the people on the right who are saying, oh, we've got to burn more coal and we've got to use gas, what they're basically arguing for is higher emissions and higher electricity prices. So if you don't care about emissions, surely you care about paying too much for electricity. I mean, literally, it's, it, is, it is that mad, Carla. And that is, that's where, you know, that is, the, that is the challenge. I mean, there's a great uh, little vignette, you know, it's actually in my book, but, but I, it, it's a good, it illustrates it very well. I mean, when I was prime minister at one point, a delegation came to see me from the, mostly from the National Party. In fact, I think they were all Nats. And they wanted me to spend $5 billion to build a new coal-fired power station. And I said, why is that? And they said, well, it's cheaper electricity. I said, really, why, why do you say that? Oh, it is. I said, well, what, what assumption have you made about the price of coal? They hadn't. Uh, what's it, do you know how much coal you have to burn to create a megawatt, you know, generate a megawatt hour of power? They mm. didn't. How much, what's the plant gonna cost? They didn't know. Anyway, we had this discussion and at the end of it, the men, they were all men except for one person, all filed out. And Bridget McKenzie, then the deputy leader of the Nationals, hung back and she said, don't worry about the numbers, PM. They don't care about them. It's religion. And this is, that's really what we've got to take on. So we've got to get, we've got to get the, the message that every, you know, business, whether you're, you know, mm. you know, people in, engaged in progressive politics or people at the, you know, running big companies, the big end of town, running banks and so forth. Lots of disagreements on many issues. But what I've said about energy and the cost of energy, they all agree with. And so we are literally, we are literally being held back by people who are, who are living in a fantasy land. And it's a very dangerous so, one. Yeah, I, understandably so. Um, uh, Tim, Malcolm talked there about sort of the relative ease at which you can have conversations about climate change with those who approach it from uh, from a scientific perspective. However, it can be harder to connect with people whose um, perspective is more ideolo ideological, or you know they are being influenced by those whose ideas are more their perspectives are more ideological. Have you come across an effective way of cutting through with? with people obviously sometimes through the science can be a bit confusing but what you know what does that messaging look like in your experience i i yeah i've had a i've been a half a lifetime experience doing that talking to people um and listening to people and listening is the biggest part of it um but you know there's some people you just need to get out of the way and tony abbott was one of those and i played a small role in moving him on i know there's other people who want to move craig kelly on and, and so forth. If we'd had just three victories of independence instead of the one we had, there'd be a very different government in Australia today. So I just ask people to get active in that space. The other thing to be very clear about is that people in the industry, in the coal industry, the oil industry, they're not the enemy, right? They're people we have to talk to, listen to, and bring along with us. You know, you go out to the coal mines in the Hunter Valley, the predominant message they're getting from the Joel Fitzgibbons of the world and the others is, if you haven't got coal, you've got nothing. And that's said so they can be kept hostage to a particular ideology um, uh, that, that's very useful to, for those in power. And that's just so untrue. I mean, there is, you know, the world is their oyster for these, these people. If you look at the German transition, the coal compromise, where not a single job is being lost, from any of the coal fields as Germany transitions away from coal, you see how a government can do this. And you look at the cost, they're not mind blowing costs. This is simply caring for each other through a difficult transition and we can do it. We know how to do it. So we just have to get that message of hope out there. And a lot of it is just going out and engaging with people. I was at it young, you know, small country town in New South Wales just a few weeks ago where there was, you know, a mayor who I, I don't think he was entirely convinced about climate change. There was a couple of, um, councillors who were climate denialists, but we ended up having a really decent discussion. You know, I'm learning the piano accordion and one of them plays the piano accordion, so that kind of helped, you know, having a, something, an interesting common. But at the end, we were talking about, yeah, wouldn't it be a good idea for the council to join the city's power partnership? Because for a little council like Young, they can get a lot out of that, that sort of arrangement. And so it's, it matter, it, to me, it's, it, it seems unbelievably slow and terrible to have to sit down with every small council in Australia and talk to people, but it pays off. You know, when I was climate commissioner, I found that just that act of listening, 
giving people their dignity, hearing about their plight and offering some ideas was, was incredibly powerful. And those who stood up and abused me, they were, weren't put down by me, they were put down by other members of their community who were embarrassed at their behavior, you know? So we, we can work together on this. Um, and again, if I could just return to the prime minister's position, I think the, being prime minister must be the loneliest place in the country, there's no doubt about it. But I've watched Scott Morrison reinvent government through the COVID pandemic, meeting with the premiers and ruling on many things through the premiers. Surely it's not beyond his remit to work out that, you know, there must be a way through this, right? I know it's difficult, it probably looks impossibly difficult with that right wing, but sometimes you've got to stand up to them. You know, Gladys Berejiklian did it recently in New South Wales and they backed down. Ways can be found, I think, to deal with this. We just have to, it's so urgent now though, we, we have to do it very soon. I don't know where I'll be, Carla, in, in five years. You know, if we don't get action and it looks like we've crossed those tipping points, what, what are we going to say to each other? I don't know, I um, just don't know. Can I, Carla, can I offer a sort of a positive, um, a more hopeful perspective just with some Always. recent Always. Yeah. So um, at the same time as we've got, you know, the Labor Party's uh, hereditary member for Hunter, Joel Fitzgibbon, uh, you know, destabilising Albanese over climate. Uh, 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 Matt Keane, the New South Wales Liberal energy minister is getting on with some renewable energy zones uh, and, you know, uh, legislating for them. And uh, they're mostly in the central west and there's obviously very good wind resources and solar resources there. Uh, Michael Johnson, who is the state national MP for Upper Hunter, so that's sort of Musselbrook, Scone, you know, Murundi area. Uh, he says, well, the Hunter should be a renewable energy zone, as it should be, uh, which Matt has welcomed. So, you know, <laughs> I mean, far be it from me to suggest how Joel Fitzgibbon should do his job, but, you know, you would think that the federal member for Hunter would be saying the coal exercise is coming, going to come to an end, regardless of what we say in Australia, because the export markets are going to, you know, fizzle out. I mean, if all of our trading partners are going to net zero. They it, it cannot do anything but. Uh, so we've got to have the a plan for the next stage. And clearly, the Hunter, for example, has got all of the transmission infrastructure. It's got a huge amount of skills. It's got energy intensive industries. It's got potential for pumped hydro storage, which is going to be important. So a renewable energy zone in the Hunter is absolutely compelling. But you know what's gone wrong, the party, you don't see the Labor Party's representative there advocating it. Although I have to say, I give credit to the members of the AMWU who have been getting involved in some local groups to look for that plan and some of, and local government leaders as well. But, mm -hmm. you know, this is the, the, this is the message that we, we need to, what we need to be de delivering is not a sort of message of transition. I mean, that's, it's not a bad word, but it has some bad connotations. This is essentially, um, you know, the, the next big opportunity. Uh, this, this is gonna be, this is gonna be bigger and better than coal. And, uh, and, and you know, leaving environmental questions mm -hmm. aside, if you want to have an aluminium industry in Australia, the only way to have that is through abundant, cheap, renewable energy. That's that that is honestly it. And that's so we should be the message should be to people in these energy intensive industries, say you guys should be at the barricade saying, come on, get on with it, because we know how to generate cheap electricity with renewables, with storage, with the right planning. And the sooner we can bring it on, the better for people whose jobs do depend on cheap power. I could, can I just add something there, Carla? Absolutely. Um, look, it's, you know, it's a matter of hope has to triumph over fear. At the moment, fear is winning because what they hear on the local Murdoch-owned newspapers or the, the radio is fear. You lose your jobs and you're going to go to shit, you know. And that's what they see around them. The, the coal mining companies that are cutting employment, I just read today about another cut in the Hunter. And what do you see if you go to a place like Singleton? You see 
know, quite a lot of disadvantage and, and I think apprehension. And we need to offer those communities a lifeline. We need to say to them, we're all in this together. Australia is going to support these communities as we transition to something far better. You know, if you fly over the Hunter, you wouldn't believe what a moonscape it looks like. I mean, just the job of remediation for that landscape is going to be the work of decades, I suspect. You know, and the bulldozers of now digging holes will be filling them in again, right? And the same people presumably driving them. So, you know, we, we know we can do this, but that message of hope has to triumph. And at the moment, we are not really successfully selling that. I want to pick up on that message of hope and the idea of communication. Um, you know, Malcolm, you've been pretty uh, active recently in, in criticising Murdoch's editorial line and the damage it's doing. <clears throat> Um, does action on climate change require further me uh, media regulation to really break the influence of that huge empire? I wonder for you both. Well, well, if I could just just say quickly, I mean, the the the, the big challenge we've got is um, uh, the, the the you know, look. The reality is we believe in freedom of speech, it's, and, and I don't think we're ever going to walk away from that. So, in that respect. Uh, you know, Mr. Murdoch is entitled to express uh, whatever views he likes, but, um, you know, we don't want to have the government regulating the content of newspapers or broadcasts or, you know, anything like that. I mean, that's, that's, that's a road we don't want to go down, full stop. But I think what we do have to do is hold them to account. I mean, Paul Kelly, who I've known for many years and I regard as a friend, was very revealing in that little exchange on Q&A when he said, how dare you? Think about it. How dare you? In all my life, I've never said, how dare you, to somebody that asked me a question or that challenged me. But this is, this basically, we have to dare to challenge the powerful in the media and hold them to account. And, you know, we can't just, you, you can't ignore it. You've got to hold them to account. They think, they think that they can hold politicians to account and they can attack often in very personal and vicious terms, advocates like Tim, as they have done. But they have to be held to account and shown up for the lies they're telling and people need to know that they're lies. I mean, I think that's, that's, the, most, you know, that's the most important thing, mm -hmm. trying to you know, have government regulation of the content of newspapers. I mean, that's, you know, that's a... That's a road that authoritarian societies go down. It's not one for Australia. I, think I, um, I, have I to can say imagine. I... Sorry, Carla. I just, no, I just saying, I can imagine us running the, the media industry a bit like we do racing. You know, we'd have um, the stewards who have, they have unlimited power. They can do anything, you know. I'd, I'd vote for John Doyle as a steward of the media industry who could, you know, <laughs> inflict unlimited uh, uh, consequences upon those who strayed from what he saw as the righteous way. We might replace the person every six months, but we need something to, to you know, to, to strike some fear into the heart of those who try to corrupt our democracy. Having had my own just tiny little example of, uh, of being under attack by the Murdoch press, I couldn't agree with you both more. And I uh, also don't value the positions that you've been in in the past in that respect. It's not a nice position. And um, we've had a really interesting question uh, come through that I want to grab hold of in, in these last little few minutes that we do have left. Um, COVID-19 involved significant government investments, hundreds of billions of dollars on emergency measures. Debt and deficit hysteria gave way to a laser-like focus on unemployment and jobs despite the costs. Should we be taking advantage of the power of federal government spending to make long-term investment, investments in both renewable infrastructure, but also in a generous and fair transition for affected workers? Tim, I'm wondering if you could answer that. You're on Sorry, mission. guys. Um, it, was, it was so striking to me that we saw the, um, the government change its ideas about debt, debt debt and deficit in the face of the COVID pandemic, you know. Um, the kind of dollars we're looking at spending for the clean energy transition, first of all, they need to be seen as investments rather than just expenditure. We're investing in a better and cleaner future. So they're not, you know, we shouldn't look at them adversely really because they'll pay back. It's like any infrastructure spending. Um, 
I don't think it's going to be of a massive scale because, as Malcolm said, it's so cheap now to do this sort of stuff. It'll be billions, no doubt about it, and it's significant. And perhaps the, you know, the whole of the, the, the adaptation piece will, will involve more billions. But the truth of the matter is it's going to be cheaper to make those investments now than it is to wait for the catastrophe to hit us and then pay the cost. You know, New Zealand has got a, has got a very sensible solution for their perennial problem of earthquakes. You know, they have a, a kind of a tax on top of all of the insurance premiums paid or the insurance paid. That, that builds into a fund to allow people to deal with the next earthquake. And, you know, Christchurch wouldn't have been there without that legislation, wouldn't have been rebuilt, because the country wouldn't have had the money. You know, maybe we need to look at, 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 at innovative ways of financing uh, these things. I'm not an economist, by the way, I'm only, I'm a scientist, so perhaps I shouldn't be commenting on it uh, uh, too much. But, but it seems to me that the transition is eminently doable. It's not gonna break the bank. Um, it'll leave us better off in so many ways. It's a kind of a no brainer, as Malcolm has said. And yet we're being held hostage by these people. I think you described them, Malcolm, as acting like terrorists, mm. threatening to blow this place up if they don't get their way. We've got to break through that. We, and we have very little time to do it. And I keep on saying that the, the climate science is really clear. We're frighteningly close to that point where we might start hitting those first tipping points of melting of the permafrost or or the destruction of the Arctic ice. Um, we just need to start moving ahead sensibly. Carla, I, I agree with Tim in this respect. I agree with him, uh, with him generally, but I just particularly, you don't, that the energy transition is actually not, it's, it's not, it doesn't actually need a government subsidy. Uh, the, if the federal government had, you know, if we had a, uh, like a, a consistent policy structure, like the you know the national energy guarantee uh, would have fitted that bill, um, and and in particular, if the federal government just did not stopped indulging in erratic interventions in the market, uh, this infrastructure would all get built. Um, I think the areas where the federal where gov government doesn't have to be the federal government needs to get its skates on is in stuff that is often too slow to deliver, like, like pumped hydro is one. I mean, I'm really glad that I got cracking on Snowy 2.0. It was seen as being a bit of a folly at the time I announced it, but I think uh, everyone's, you know, people now recognize it as a vital necessity, but we're going to need more long-term storage, but that, that'll need a bit of push, um, but it's, it's very, you know, it's, it's certainly very financeable. Uh, the um, the areas that uh, where you do need to see some go uh, you know proactive role from government is and I mean well let me give you an example so one of the you know policy innovations during my time was city deals and these were you know as a Western Sydney city deal as a city deal in Launceston towns for many other places around the country and it wasn't a you know it was a, a, it was a sensible idea you get federal government, state government, local government, other big stakeholders around the table. You say, okay, what do we want to achieve? Uh, all right, let's agree on that. Uh, who's going to do what? Who's going to pay for, you know, you pay for this, I'll pay for that. You know, are we going halves or one third, two thirds, halves? Okay, done. And you basically, and then you get everyone committed and on the same page. Now, that's really what uh, should be the focus on those areas that are going to be affected by the decline of coal, the decline and demise of coal. And, and so, you know, the Hunter is one, there are areas in Queensland, obviously, that have similar description, and you've just got to get on and do it now. And it just, this is not, you know, this is a, this is a, this is, if you like, preparing for uh, the inevitable. And, but, but do so in an energetic, creative and imaginative and positive way. So that's that, that's what I think government should do. As far as infrastructure is concerned, Carla, you know, debt's never been cheaper. So if ever there was a time for governments to borrow and uh, invest in uh, economic infrastructure or any infrastructure, now's the time to do it. Clearly, you don't want to be building white elephants and, you know, spending a lot of money on things that, you know, don't have any value or any utility. But uh, this is not a this this is not a time to be. Uh, penny pinching, that's for sure, with rates as low as they are and the need 
for investment as great as it is. Thank you. So what, what we're seeing is, uh, I think it's the, both the left and the right uh, kind of push forward policies that, that um, kind of push blame onto individuals, so population control and single use plastics. Um, how do you think we keep the focus on the largest emitters? Because that really is one of the fundamental issues here. And is the reason we get distracted because of the role of political donations of fossil fuel lobby, et cetera? Maybe I could jump in there, Carla, and just reinforce what I've been saying all night yet again, that this is the period of consequence now. We're at the, the absolute, absolute point of the crisis. And yes, population is an issue. Thankfully, we know how to fix it. You just improve the welfare of the poorest women on the planet and improve their economic situation and so forth. The thing is, it's really, we're at the point now where if we don't act in the next few years, we really stand at serious risk of triggering irreversible climate change. So just think about that. That's a bit like in COVID terms, the, the disease is doubling every four days and you've left it a month without acting, right? It becomes impossibly big. You can't rein it back in again. So that's the situation we face right now with climate. And I would just reinforce that the Australian Prime Minister could be a hero to his nation and a hero to the world by taking the right actions. It's widely understood in the scientific community and increasingly in the public that this is the moment of crisis and we need someone to step up and lead us through that moment of crisis. Thank you. Malcolm, your thoughts? Well, I, I, look, I, I, agree with what, I agree with what Tim said. I mean, it's... Uh, Yes, it is, a, it is a time of crisis. I mean, for heaven's sake, uh, you know, the, you know this, time, this time a year ago, the country was on fire. You know, we had the worst, uh, the worst air quality in the world in some of our big cities, including our capital, Canberra. Uh, you know, the, uh, we all remember that. I mean, look, we, we have seen the consequences of global warming at their most apocalyptic in Australia last summer. Now, yes, the COVID pandemic, I guess, has distracted people's attention from that, but it hasn't gone away. I mean, it's like you can have all of the political debates you like. You can have Donald Trump can say whatever he likes. You know, Rupert Murdoch can write whatever uh, editorials he likes. But the as the greenhouse gases accumulate in the atmosphere, the temperatures will rise. I mean, that's that that's physics, right? So, so that's so. Yes, the need to act is greater than ever, but we mm. also have we also have no longer any economic excuses. Now, I'm not saying they were ever good excuses. I was, you know, I supported a uh, an emissions trading scheme. You know, as you as you as you'll all remember if you can remember all that painful history. Uh, but the you know we're now in a position where we can have our cake and eat it too. I mean. The other thing I think we've got to bear in mind is, <clears throat> you know, the argument that we're only 1.3% of global emissions. I mean, Tim's made some very good points about that. But, you know, we have to, we are prepared as Australians to take global responsibility, not to take responsibility for the globe, obviously, but to take our share of responsibility and lead in so many areas. I mean, you know, we have had a pretty, Compared to other countries, we've had a pretty good experience with COVID. Look, there's been, there's been death, there's been tragedy, there's been loss of incomes, loss of occupations and so forth. It hasn't, hasn't been a happy experience, but many other countries have done it much worse. So our governments, and I stress governments, because I think the states have really done the heavy lifting here, uh, can be proud of the leadership they've shown and the support they've had from their communities. And our politicians will be bragging about that and trying to take credit of that at every possible opportunity. So if we're prepared to do that, and if we think our experience is something we want to show to the world, then we should be prepared to do the same uh, on climate. And, you know, I, I, th I think it's a, look, anyway, I mean, again, we're, I'm sort of, we're, we're repeating <laughs> ourselves, but I mean, it is fundamentally, fundamentally, the problem is, a political one inside the coalition. It is that toxic troika 
of right-wing populism, right-wing media, and the fossil fuel lobby. Now, you talked about mm. donations. They're always influential in politics. But in this case, I think the opposition to climate action is largely cultural, and it comes out of this bizarre way in which, uh, which is what I was you know, taking Paul Kelly mm. uh, uh, to account for, the way in which issues of physics uh, have been and science have been turned into issues of value and identity. Now that mm. that we are paying a heavy price for that. We are indeed. Um, it has been. We're coming to the end of our time, and I, I just I want to note that it has been uh, a, an enormous year. And as you as you have both noted, one of incredible challenges. We have also talked a little bit, um, or quite a lot actually, about the hope that exists if we can really start to move and move now with the urgency that's required. I wanted to ask you both a quick parting question, if I can. What's giving you hope at a personal level at the moment? I'll start with you, Malcolm. Well, my the, the thing that gives me hope is, well, firstly, the change of government in Washington that's pending, uh, but also the recent announcements by major economies, in particular China, to move to net zero. Uh, the, and, and, you know, and the fact that now, the, as I said, we've got no longer any excuses. The technology and the economics is on our side. Mm -hmm. You know, if we, we know that we can have abundant, clean energy, that, you know, now that's, and, and cheap, abundant, cheap, clean energy. Now that is sure, Certainly something surely to be rationale, sure. surely whether you're voting with your head or your heart or just your hip pocket, you will support that. But that's the... Mm. You know, the message that has to be got through is that those people who are advocating a continuation of fossil fuels uh, and, you know, coal huggers or, you know, gas lovers or whatever, however you want to call them, they are basically advocating for higher prices and higher emissions. That's, and, that, and, that is, and that is not rhetoric. That's true. That's a fact. So that's what we've got to back in. Thank you. you and Tim, I... Ooh, yes. I'll just be very brief. I realize please, right no, up against the clock. <laughs> but I just wanted to say, I, I've been given hope by a sense that people's values are shifting, that this whole COVID pandemic has sort of showed us that we can, we can go bravely into a very difficult situation and do the right thing to the benefit of our communities and to our families. And yes, it's an economic hit, but we've learned it isn't the end of the world. We, we can take care of each other. We can have JobKeeper. We can have other means of, of helping. People are reinventing the way they live as a result. So I, I just think we're, we're part of this really interesting period of change where people's fundamental values are being reevaluated. And it, I think it's quite telling that the, you know, the Barnaby Joyce's and the Matt Canavan's and the Joel Fitzgibbons are leaving you know, positions of power and authority. And maybe we're just seeing the beginning of, of, a, of a really fundamental change there where we will have a more, a more emphasis on the value of each other and the environment and all of that above just the money. So anyway, that's where I am. It's not a bad place to be, hopeful. Um, I want to go back to something that I heard you say earlier, Tim, which was it was a message to the Prime Minister, but I guess having looked at the fact that we've got a couple of thousand, few thousand people listening to us at the moment, I think it could be a message for everybody that no matter what your job is, what, your, what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, where you live, to consider the fate and the welfare of all Australians and how it is that you bring yourself to and engage with this really urgent and important work. I think it's really highly probable that what we do in the next few years will define our future and our children's future. So it's just enormously important that we focus now. This is the moment. It's not five years from now. It's not the next election. This is the moment. And with people like yourselves leading that charge, uh, I am also sharing that I'm hopeful that we will see the kind of change that we need to in this country to um, take us into the future. I want to thank you both for joining us this evening. We could obviously stay here for many more hours talking to you, um, but you've got places to, to be and things to do. Um, but it has been an absolute pleasure to spend some time with you and, and hear 
your pearls of wisdom, your perspectives, your passion and your ambitions uh, for this space for us in this country. And, and I thank you on behalf of, of GetUp and also on behalf of the many people that have joined us this evening. I'm now going to throw back over to Paul to take us out. Yeah, thanks, Carla. And um, huge thanks to, to Tim, Malcolm and Carla for speaking tonight and giving so much for all of us. There's uh, been over 2,300 of us engaging tonight. Um, and and that, that's what gives me hope. It's the tens of thousands of people that engage in climate action around the country. We've got some really strong points here. Um, there are no more excuses. This is the period of consequence. We know what we need to do. We've got to focus on right-wing populism, right-wing media, and the fossil fuel lobby, as Malcolm Turnbull outlined. We know that we have to act now. That means the Morrison government have to be the ones to step up and be those ones taking action. And we know that people power can drive them there. In the coming days, we're gonna be sending um, out an opportunity for all GetUp members um, to get a hold of Tim's book. So please stay tuned. It's a really powerful read and can help empower us for the climate action that we need to take together going forward. And coming up in December, you'll see the research that Carla um, mentioned at the beginning of the talk, a real deep dive, the most comprehensive piece of research we know of looking at over 10,000 publications by the Murdoch Press and how that's um, misled the public on the climate change. So that'll be a hard hitting piece of research. So thanks again to our panelists and um, uh, thanks on behalf of the over a million GetUp members across the country for your participation this evening. Thank you. Thank you.